Dude, you know, in uh, Scorsese's Raging Bull, when the boxer Jake LaMotta pours ice water on his junk yeah. just to like stay focused and aggressive. Right. That's me right before we record these episodes. Okay. All right. Just wanted you to know. So did that just happen or? Uh... Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I'm ready. Let's do this right now. Let's do it. <laughs> Welcome back to Hollywood versus Cleveland. Salty movie and media reviews. I'm here uh, in Hollywood as always. My name is Steve Wright and joining me is John Malloy from Cleveland. How's it going, John? Very good. How are you, Steve? I'm doing well. I'm looking forward to chatting about this movie. This time we kind of picked it a little bit randomly. I made a movie called Alan the Dog. So I was kind of Googling around dog titles and I came across A Boy and His Dog 1975 with Don Johnson. And I was like, oh, I want to watch that at some point. And I realized I did actually see it as a kid long time ago. Uh, it tells the story of a young man and his telepathic dog as they wander a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The movie is directed by L.Q. Jones, who also wrote the screenplay based on the 1969 novella of the same title by Harlan Ellison, who was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and died in Los Angeles, California, in 2018 at the age of 84. <laughs> a boy and his dog, original short story, novella, and characters by Harlan Ellison. Uh, so, John, you're our literary guy. What do you know about this writer uh, and or this novella? Um, Harlan Ellison is like a, a pretty well-known science fiction writer. He's done a number of things and he's coming into the science fiction world after a little bit of a change from Who Goes There that we reviewed before with John Campbell. That was, you know, we're talking 38. And Harlan Ellison wrote A Boy and His Dog in 68. And a lot has happened. So with uh, Campbell's novella, we're looking at sort of the beginning of like science fiction and in, in, in terms of its popularity. I mean, there have been other science fiction stories, but in the beginning, people were very concerned with staying true to science and like making all of the story be based about science and what science does and how it impacts society. And in this era, 30 years later, we're starting to get to people getting more creative with uh, science. And so in, instead of having the entire plot be about some scientific concept, it's often a plot device that leads to a more fictional concept. Instead of being fascinated with science, it's fascinated with the possibilities of story that can change due to scientific uh, tools or premises. So instead of science being the entire focus of the movie, now we have science fiction movies where, you know, there's a science fiction element that creates a situation and then what's the fallout from that? So you start to see like science fiction that is is going farther away from the science part and more into the fiction part. And I think at that point in the science fiction literary world, you start to have what people call hard science fiction and soft science fiction. So hard science fiction would be a story that is based in realistic terms and has no magic and any no things that are unexplainable or at least theoretical within our current concept of the universe. Uh, in hard science fiction, you see a lot of like, like realistic descriptions of what spacecraft would actually, and like talking about like fuel and, um, you know, there's no sound in space, right? So you're not going to have... Pew, pew. So uh, Star Wars and Star Trek are kind of like a emblematic d diversions. Star Trek being a little more hard than Star Wars with the light swords and the and the laser guns. But I mean, I, even I think most science fiction people would classify Star Trek at times as being a little soft as well. I mean, some of the harder science fiction that comes out is really focused on what actually might happen. Ursula K. Le Guin is an example of a writer who she's trying to stay in the realm of seriousness, but also explore interesting human topics while in a science fiction sort of setting. This guy, Harlan Ellison, is one of the early guys to dabble into... Um, some of this softer stuff so what we have in this movie is a premise and then and then let's tell a story after that premise has been provided and the premise is a science fiction premise and the setting is a science fiction premise but from that point forward we're kind of exploring some other kind of topics and ideas um yeah harlan ellison was from cleveland he was a little bit edgy and wanted to combine some elements of real humanistic stuff with science fiction to make it a little more colorful maybe we see that in this movie um in the early science fiction stuff it's like 
not talking about things like lust. Where's the kid? He's spending the night with Johnny Lambert. Or, you know, some of the dirtier elements of the human psyche or, you know, the, the places that we don't normally go to all the time. There was another writer during this era called Michael Moorcock who, who really liked to kind of combine these pop culture concepts, sex and uh, rock and roll into the, like fantasy stuff. So there was a lot of this going on in the 70s as well with like animation. And Harlan Ellison is kind of in that group. Um, he actually wrote the screenplay for what is arguably one of the most famous Star Trek episodes called The City on the Edge of Forever. So yeah, Harlan Ellison was a, like a pretty big uh, personality in science fiction writing and uh, the science fiction world. All right, man. Well, that's cool. So the movie is directed by L.Q. Jones, who wrote the screenplay based on the novella. He had a really long acting career. He's mostly known as an actor. He only directed one other movie called The Devil's Bedroom in 1964. Um, but dude, as an actor, he was in The Patriot, Casino, tons of TV shows going back to the mid-50s, from The Dukes of Hazard to Lancer to Charlie's Angels to everything, basically. Do you remember in Casino when the brother-in-law was such a mess up? He's weak. He's incompetent. He jeopardizes the whole place. There's not much more I can do for him. <laughs> you have got me there. <laughs> Old Don is as useless as tits on a boar. <clears throat> but he is my brother-in-law. That's the director of this movie, L.Q. Jones. So anyway, you'd he's a recognizable guy. The movie stars, of course, a very young Don Johnson. And keep in mind, the character he's playing, Vic, is 15 years old in the novella. Also starring Suzanne Benton as the ambitious Quilla June Holmes, Jason Robards as the leader of the group that lives underground, Topeka. And he's the biggest star here, clearly. He had been in Once Upon a Time in the West, the Sergio Leone movie. Jason Robards later was in All the President's Men, Magnolia, Max Dugan Returns, and Parenthood. But he was kind of the biggest star at this time, for sure, uh, to be in this movie. Finally, Tim McIntyre does the music for the film and also voices the dog, Blood. Enough foreplay. Let's talk about the movie, yo. The beginning is in your face. I mean, starting with all the, the nuclear explosions. I mean, that's pretty harsh. And then they've got the scrolling. It says World War IV, and it says politicians had finally solved the problem of urban blight, which I had to look up, basically. I mean, I kind of knew what it meant. Definition I found, it said the decay and deterioration of an urban area due to neglect or age. So in other words, it's better just to blow everything up than fix everything, which in a way sets it off on this sort of sarcastic, sardonic note, which the movie is because it's trying to balance this humor and this incredibly dark wasteland. You know, Wikipedia describes the movie as a black comedy science fiction film. And I agree with that description. And potentially, this is why the movie doesn't totally work for me. I have a better appreciation watching it a second time this morning from last night. But it's so dark at the beginning. When Vic comes across the woman who's been brutally attacked, it's only a few minutes after that they play this hokey buddy, you know, fun music as they're walking away. Gosh. <laughs> That's clever, isn't it? And that juxtaposition, I think ultimately for me, maybe is the reason it, it's, I never settled in and felt comfortable in the movie. Uh, but that said, I thought there were some funny moments in the movie, some clever twists. And overall, I do think the movie works as a story about a man who wants one thing, a mate, but ends up choosing another, his friend Blood, a telepathic dog. I just want to ask you, John, uh, did you like the movie? Let me just say that I thought it was weird. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. that was my takeaway, that it was weird. It's hard to box this movie up. It's pretty hard to describe. I don't know that I would go around recommending it to people, I yeah. guess. And, and if that's the way you would say whether you like it or not, then then I'd probably say no, because I think that's fair. I, I think if somebody had an interest in some angle that this movie explored, I would be like, oh, did you see that movie? Because they do that, too. But I don't know if it's a good use of anyone's time, really, unless you're doing a deep dive. I don't want to be sounding harsh either. There's some really interesting things to talk about about this movie. There are. 
and it does it does a lot of things well the relationship between him and the dog i buy it you know like when they're talking back and forth i buy that they're friends i buy that they're talking and just the the mechanics of them talking to each other and the acting like my belief was suspended and i like them together and i do think the production was pretty good like i believe in this this world i didn't feel like i was in some terrible set i pretty much uh, believed it overall it felt like a comedic version of mad max although mad max hasn't been made yet didn't get made till what 79 Soylent Green came out two years before this movie in 1973, gives you a little bit of time frame, and Rollerball came out this same year, another kind of dystopian type movie. George Miller cited uh, L.Q. Jones as uh, an influence. Really? In the Mad Max series. Oh, cool. So especially you could see like, not necessarily Mad Max, but Road Warrior, where those like desert sequences and there's like... There's like damage to the ground where people can like jump into the hole and hide and stuff. Um, a lot of similarity there. Like th that roaming pack of guys, they're looking for food. You get yourself up. Yeah. Or you ain't never gonna get up. I wonder why they hang around him. Mm, probably just charisma. That completely reminded me of Mad Max. So yeah, you can see similarities there for sure. And I did like it a little better. Be I'll tell you why I liked it better this morning than last night. That uncomfortableness that I talked about. Uh, like, for example, when he's with uh, Quilla and he's, you know, he's going to rape her. I mean, that's what he's going to do. Now, they soften it a little bit by making him human and he's better than the real bad guys. And you give Vic a little slack. He, he's 15, growing up in a nuclear wasteland. But still, that's kind of the dynamic in this first scene with Vic and Quilla June, you know, and it, that is the dynamic. And that just makes me uncomfortable enough that it's kind of hard, like I said, to kind of like settle in and appreciate slash follow the story. What's your name? Quilla June Holmes. It's a weird name. Now there's a twist with her. It turns out she's using him but we don't know that in that moment on a rewatch. I know Vic is actually more of a victim here than Quilla June. So things are less uncomfortable and therefore less distracting for me. He has this weird thing with the dog where the dog, um, the dog's fucking with him a little bit. Like the yeah. dog keeps <laughs> calling him Albert. Right. Al. Mm -hmm. And his name is Vic. Yeah. Albert, you have all the cranial capacity of a canary. So I kind of looked into that. My, my theory while I was watching the movie was that he had been with a, another dude prior to this guy. And that's what I was sort of going with. Mm. But as I looked it up, in, in context of this book, this guy, Albert Payson Terhune. So he wrote a bunch of novels about dogs and boys and dogs. Okay. And this is like a bit of a tribute or an, like maybe an ironic tribute to this guy because it's so dark. So it's, he's sort of sarcastically calling him Albert. Well, that's one of the things I had written down as one of the things that worked for me. So I, I mentioned the dynamic just in terms of like the believability of him interacting with the dog. I bought that, but also just the idea that there's a very, very smart dog and a man of average intelligence. I think that dynamic is is it was working well on it and i was just gonna bring up the screamers yeah that was kind of unclear to me I didn't it's a totally little bit unclear it's kind of subtle they bring up that there are screamers around and everyone's scared of screamers vic says to quilla june one of them touches you you're dead green dead so i'm thinking radiated men right lq jones appears in the movie so he's he's in the uh like snuff film that they're watching at the the little movie theater it's like a little more organized than the scavengers that are out in the world he you have to check your heat in when you come in and, and you bribe the guy and i mean road warriors like that too right they they some people decide to work together and make this collective and uh then the other everyone outside of the city is like these uh savages so uh, like collectivism versus individualism or uh chaos versus organization um uh, that's the these post-apocalyptic visions of the world are 
everyone will float into one of those two groups. Right. And then there's a commentary on which one is more savage. Right. So when Vic goes down there, when he leaves blood and goes down to the quote unquote civilized people who live in this underground society, Topeka, Vic is quickly captured and they've got him strapped down to extract. Trigger warning, the word semen is about to be used. And they've got him strapped down to extract his semen to repopulate the area down there. He doesn't get to do it the manual way, which he's very bummed about. But uh, when he's escaping, Quilla is trying to convince him to stay there. And he says, get the hell out of here. I want to see blood again. I want to get in a good, straightforward fight with some son of a bitch over a can of beans. I got to get back in the dirt so I feel clean. Wait a minute. So in other words, it's like, which world is more horrible, you know? And dude, when you see the underground people and how twisted it is, and Jason Robard's character, Mr. Craddock, is such a brutal man. Defiance of this committee, duly elected and ordained by the people, will not be tolerated. The farm, both of them. There's like some 1984 elements going on, or right. some. This council sort of decides everybody's fate. That's right. And so when he's trying to escape, you're not sitting there going, oh, dude, stay there. Well, I did find myself rooting yeah. for. So at, when she reveals what she's up to to him, finally. Oh, yeah. I'm going to run to Pika. You and me. Maybe some others. We'll be the committee. Do anything we want, any time we want. We'll have them bow and scrape for a change. I did find myself rooting for him to like go with her ideas. So basically what she wants to do is she wants to kill the the council or the triumvirate or whatever. And then she's going to be in charge. And she's like, and you can, you and me can be the council. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know why, but I, I found myself rooting for that outcome. I don't think the movie wants you necessarily to root for that. I mean, the, the movie's sort of positioning it as they're just going to do the same thing that the earlier council did or like it, it doesn't. Well, she's scary. You know, like that's, that's one. I like her character a lot. Quilla, because, you know, she, she really does play this vi- kind of like a victim you know, when we first meet her, she's kind of like, you know, sort of dazed and confused. And then the second she's in the underground, she shows her true colors and she's bossing people around. She's got this crazy ambition. I'm going to smile and I'm going to curtsy the right time to all the right people because it ain't going to be much longer. The song of David will not wait even for you, Quilla June Holmes. That is your class. Ah, uh, yes, Mrs. Kamek. <laughs> So I liked that twist with her. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't know if I was rooting for him to, to stay with her. I was kind of rooting for him to get back to blood, you know? Right. Well, that that was true, yeah. That's right. And I think that's the key. And I, of course, that leads to the twist at the end. But, but before we get to that, uh, another thing that worked for me was the goodbye scene between Vic and blood before he goes down in, into the underground. Take care of yourself. Do my best. I'll catch up with you. Sure. So long, partner. You know, I kind of bought into that emotion there. I wasn't like sitting there crying. I, I, you know, again, this doesn't make my top, you know, 5,000 films. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, you know, but still, like, I thought that was, you know, pretty well done. And, and you do buy into those guys, which is important to the movie, considering uh, where we're going. One more thing about uh, Craddock, played by Jason Robards. My favorite part of the movie, and it goes back to what I found funny, is the way he plays that character as totally nonchalant. You meet him. He's reading the paper. He's always like doing something else. He's reading the paper and people are being brought before him in that little church. He's passing judgment so casually. Let's make these uh, heart attacks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wreath from the committee. Doc will do the eulogy. Services at Lakeside Methodist, the usual. And may God have mercy on your soul. Even when they're hitting, when uh, he and Quilla, June Holmes, are with a crowbar hitting their way out of the of the wedding ceremony scene, and people are panicking, he goes, God damn it. You know, I mean, that's a choice. You know, he's not like, he's just so like, 
nonchalant in some ways. Oh, they start shooting Michael, the robot, and he does he doesn't even look up to see the action. Let's get on with it. He doesn't care that they're causing a disturbance. No, he's just like, and then he goes, oh, he goes, get another Michael from the warehouse and make sure to have the engineer take the smile off his face. Another humorous line. But I love, that's my favorite part of the movie is Jason Robards, uh, his choices, and maybe that's in the script, but his nonchalant dictatorship is fantastic. Quilla June. Quilla June Hall. For 2,644. Lack of respect, wrong attitude, failure to obey authority. How say you want it all? All right. All right. All right. The farm immediately. The other thing is, the movie is called A Boy and His Dog, right? But mm-hmm. like a b- good portion of it, they're dealing with a different the, the dynamic, which is that society down there. Mm-hmm. Topeka. They're broadcasting all these like six, 50s and 60s style, like Cold War era of normalization cultural things, like how to make green beans and... um you know how to behave and a man should never be ashamed to own he has been in the wrong another helpful hint for living by the way i'm i'm guessing all the creepy face paint is because they've all they all live underground so they're they're so pale at this point this has become the the makeup style for everyone and in terms of why Topeka is the way it is Kula June tells him my parents were from Oklahoma before the war. And so, and now Topeka is a city in Kansas, but to me, it's just this bastardization of what they remember, what they've read about America. So when Vic gets knocked out, when he first gets down there and he wakes up, they're playing this American uh, theme song. This is how they see America. By the way, it's insanely white. I did not see I did not see one African American uh no, down was... in the underground. So that's how I kind of took that, but it's definitely twisted and uncomfortable. It's a sort of a make America great again kind yeah, of it world. totally is. It is. <laughs> it's, it's a dictatorship too, because you know, Mr. Uh, Craddock, as we talked about, rules Topeka with this casual iron fist with the other two members of the committee. There are elements of Aldous Huxley and Brave New World. Or Plato's Republic, like this notion of you're going to create a society that's perfect. And then, you know, this small group of people are going to engineer a great society. And and this goes back to kind of what what you were saying was, is it great when somebody does that? And so there's like pros and cons to both of these worlds and neither of them are that great. And as we get to the end, we hit the our main character chooses one over the other. And that little like city place where they see the porno film, that is a compromise of sorts. It's like a, it's halfway between this world of scavenging and this uh, world that's super organized. It's like an imagination of something that might be in between those two concepts. And by the way, you know, in terms of where we're headed in this movie, in terms of the final twist, Kula June asks... Vic, how do you talk to blood? Because Vic clearly is the only one who can hear the dog communicating. Well, how come I can't hear him? Oh, he said something one time. Because we had a feeling for each other or something. What do you mean, like love? I guess. So that's the first time it's brought up that they love each other. Right after that, we'll get a nice little place and we'll spend a lot of time together alone and we'll do whatever we feel like doing. And when Blood comes to visit, he can have his own room. What are you talking about? Well, I don't exactly think he's going to fit in down under. No way. This is the first time it's like it's either the dog or me. And then he has a similar conversation with blood right after that what good is she it's all we can do to feed ourselves as it is you know you're starting to sound like a goddamn poodle you're starting to sound like a jackass so there's this this idea planted it's 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 the dog or me or it's me uh, or the woman and i think that's that's a big moment that, that at least gets it implanted in terms of uh where we're going so at the very end vic escapes topeka with quilla june He's got what he wants, or at least he's hoping to. He's got the girl and the dog. 
that's what he wanted. He wanted to go in and get her. He succeeded. Then he finds the dog near death. Speaking of death, I love this shot of Quilla June. How long has it been since you ate? Well, I grabbed a lizard yesterday. Maybe it was the day before. I can't seem to remember it. Funny. <laughs> he needs food and he needs medicine. We gotta get it fast. Because we can't make it without him. We're too late, darling. Thing we can do about it now. Now, I love you. If you love me, you'll come on too. This is the moment where you find out he now has to make a choice. The choice has been given to us earlier in the movie, at least introduced to us the dog or her, or the dog or her. And you see Don Johnson overacting a teeny bit, I think, because he's thinking. (laughs) And he looks at blood and he looks at her and then they fade out on her. And then you already hear the fire and there's clearly like something set up over the campfire where something was on a spigot of some kind. You haven't eaten a bite. I'm not hungry. And if it wasn't totally clear what that was about, Blood makes that joke to him as they walk away. She said she loved me. Well, it wasn't my fault she picked me to get all wet brain over. Well, I'd say she certainly had marvelous judgment out of it, if not particularly good taste. <laughs> particularly good taste. So there's no, you know, end of taxi driver or end of Shane, you know, sort of, or end of the thing, uh, you know, where there's some kind of like ambiguity. It's very clear he chose the dog over her. So a boy and his dog, to me, the ending works because those moments were set up. It's either the dog or the woman. And this is just a weird story about a boy and his dog. And he's always, you know, trying to get a woman. And when he finally does, he ends up choosing the dog over the woman. Um, I, w- I wanted to mention, you know, that little banjo or the little guitar, little guitar playing guy. Yeah. Who's on like a leash. Hey. Hey. If you were any character in the movie, that's who you would be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Well, thanks for uh, chatting about a boy and his dog. And now I'll uh, work on editing to try my best to have you make any kind of sense at all and uh, go from there. Good luck. No, I'm just kidding, dude. Great chatting with you, man. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining in once again for Hollywood versus Cleveland. And we hope you uh, check out some of our other videos. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. All right. Peace. Peace in the Middle East. See you, man.